Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Fritz Zilocek. I'm an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine at the Human Genome Sequencing Center. Um, and today I'm going to present our work uh, of the structure variant calling map across 945 Hunter individuals uh, using long read sequence. And this work is done together with Sean Poon Fun Lab uh, at the Bodan University. So why do we care about structure variants or what, stru what are structure variants? Uh, structure variants are often loosely defined as 50 base pair uh, genomic alterations uh, that can be uh, clustered or have different types in terms of deletions, duplications, insertions, inversions, and translocations. These usually cause a higher diversity in terms of base pair than SMBs, while they remain in lower numbers than SMBs on their own compared to different genomes. On the right side, you see kind of thematic about how we detect these kind of structural variants. Uh, often we detect them by kind of split reads, where we align two or more regions of the same read to different regions um, on the genome or in different orientations as they came out from the sequence. And by this signal, we can then interpret the location, so the start and stop location of those structural variants, also called breakpoint, as well as the structural variant type. Um, as I said, there are five different types of it, um, as well as the sequence content. And that allows us to interpret these structure runs um, uh, across different uh, scenarios. So like structure runs are very often discussed as being important for different, different aspects of medical or biological research. Uh, one of the very easy points to look about or think about is evolution, where we can talk about, uh, for example, gene gains and gene losses um, across different members of the population or across different evolutionary distances, and we and others have shown that structural variants are sometimes um, playing an important role in segregating these different species or these different subpopulations. Uh, more in terms of uh, Beta College of Medicine, maybe, and human genetics, it's very important to take structural variants into account for genomic disorders. Here I'm just showing you a structural variant map across the SKBF3 breast cancer cell line. Uh, where we have multiple connections between different parts of the chromosomes, indicating uh, important and, and less important um, genomic alterations of this breast cancer cell line that uh, lead to the tumor progression. But also they are important and playing an important role in other diseases despite cancer, for example, in Mendelian diseases, where we often look at deletions and duplications de novo to a certain patient, or in more complex diseases like adult diseases and cardiovascular diseases or disease risks, um, as well as um, neurological diseases. And that brings us to the third box, which is the impact uh, of structural variants on regulation. And clearly and easily to think about this part is when you have a deletion or a duplication of a certain gene and how this impacts the transcription and therefore maybe also the translation rate of this particular gene into protein concentrations. And then lastly, on the bottom, on the bottom right, we have measured the impact on terms of phenotypes of structure. And clearly, this is kind of cherry picked, but what I'm showing you here are actually um, the impact of different structure and types uh, in terms of heritability on the y axis across different phenotypes on the x axis. And here it's just phenotypes that have been impacted by these structure variants across 25% uh, or more. So in red, you see uh, the impact in terms of copy numbers. In, red, in black, you see the impact in terms of rearrangement. And in this grayish color, you see the impact in, in terms of SMB. And only when we take the full complexity of a genome uh, into consideration, we can really resolve or gain much more knowledge about certain traits and certain phenotypes and how the genomic component interacts um, or influences this measurement. Um, just as a reminder, for example, Parkinson's disease, which is one of these um, hard to assess uh, adult diseases, I think are currently uh, described by only 15 or 20 percent of heritability that is completely explained, um, which is, as you can see on the, on the y axis, just 0.15, which is much slower. And one reason for that could be actually that um, the, the, uh, that multiple variants are in, interacting in this um, phenotype of Parkinson's disease that are hard to identify and hard to um, put together in association. But really what we want to talk today about um, is, is how, this, uh, how this detection of these structural variants account, uh, is related to the technologies that we have at hand. So like in 1940s and 1980s, we had kind of 
carry typing, which uh, revealed to us uh, different chromosomal or chromosomal arm duplications or losses. Um, but then really over fish and genomic microarrays, we got a finer resolution of gene duplications or gene losses uh, using this microarray technology. But then ultimately in 2007 and 2008, we started with high throughput uh, short read sequencing or DNA sequencing with former times Lexus and obviously in the past years, the Lumina machines uh, that are producing this uh, incredible detailed pad entries um, that lead to an explosion of, of genetic variations and our ability to study them across human genomes, but also other organisms. And then in the last couple of years, really, I would say like in the last uh, three to five years, quite frankly, uh, we've seen advance in long read technologies such as the uh, uh, bio SQL2 that, has, that can produce, produce uh, high fidelity reads, high fi reads with an incredible accuracy of like 15 pp to 20 pp length, or with Oxford Nanopore, I'm just showing here a mini ion uh, machine for like Promethean, small what we are using in this study here, that can produce very long reads uh, with approximately an error rate between 3 and 8% uh, and upcoming updates even lower than this. And these two machines really enabled us to get a better characterizations of these important variant type of structure rounds and also learn more about their um, mechanisms and more about the interactions uh, with, different, with respect to different phenotypes. My group and others have studied this interaction uh, and, and the detection possibility of structure rounds deeply. And together with the NIST um, genome in the bottle, we produced this nice paper uh, last year, put out this nice paper last year that um, showed the first kind of high uh, quality benchmark for structure rounds on the human genome, uh, where we characterized insertions and deletions, um, leveraging multiple technologies in an Ashkenazi trio. And as you can see, depending on the technology and depending on, on the methods that you are using to detect these structures, and the detection rate varies a lot. So we kind of use this approach to bring together using assembly as well as mapping approaches to bring together really a robust uh, benchmark set, which tries uh, method development, but also standards further. And then together with the FDA, we recently looked into the variability of structure rounds across different sequencing events, getting a better sense of what we can expect in the field, so to speak, across like within different cohorts or within different studies, for example. And you can see that there's, of course, the main variability in this uh, matrix here is between the two parents, which is LCL8 and LCL7. And then compared to the two children, LCL5 and LCL6, that are identical twins, basically. But you can still see, depending on the methodology that we are using in short read structure variant detection, um, you're having, you're obtaining different results. And this is, of course, something that we want to avoid and, and get better at in the near future. So, giving these two, um, giving these two projects, but also others, what we can really derive from them is that long read sequencing is really improving the structure of calling and detection. And this can be seen in multiple levels. So, first of all, we can see that the more comprehensive we can detect this variant type. So, in long read studies, um, we often see structural round counts of 20 to 23,000 structural rounds um, across human genome, whereas short read studies often just report something in the realm of 10 to 12,000 uh, structural rounds in human genomes. And the majority of differences here are really insertions, uh, meaning like novel sequences that are sometimes missed by the short read technology itself, or they are hard, harder to characterize by this technology or using this technology. Furthermore, uh, when we use long reads, we can assess repetitive regions uh, more broadly and more comprehensively across the human genome. So one interesting paper came out from Mendeckler in 2019 identifying 193 medical genes where short read sequencing kind of falls short, so to speak, in characterizing at least one part or, part or more of the excellence of these genes, despite the fact that these are really important and prominent genes in the medical field. He is showing um, and the need of long read sequencing and the improved assessment of them. These are including prominent genes, for example, like LPA or several HLA genes, which are playing important roles um, across cardiovascular disease or immune deficiencies or cancer. Um, and then the other consortium that is really worth mentioning here is, of course, the T2C consortium that is going to be coming up. And there's also a talk from Karen Liga in this um, session uh, where they can reconstruct 
the entire centromere and telomeres and really using this long read technologies to have a continuous overview across the entire chromosome, uh, which is really fascinating and really kind of the next uh, next level, so to speak, compared to what we have right now in our reference genomes is 38 and, and GSH 38.7. Um, and that also is possible because long reads improve the assembly quality um, of our samples at hand that we have. So we, we can improve continuity, which we can measure over the N50. Um, therefore, we also have less gaps or so unresolved regions in our assemblies. And nowadays, we, there's more and more a trend that we actually also apply phasing in these um, assemblies to accurately reconstruct it to different haplotypes. So giving all these kind of advancements, um, of technologies and like the technologies also continue to advance in terms of higher yield and therefore lower costs um, and software advancements either from my group or from other groups, you can really see this kind of trend emerging of having more and more long read based population sequencing or in general long read based sequencing going. And this uh, chart we put together uh, just shows you the number of samples across different studies across basically the past two years from start of 2019 to start of 2021. And here each dot just represents a study with five or more genomes done with long reads. And we characterized here in the size of the dots with different genomic sizes. So like you can see in the beginning, um, it was a lot of, it was a few um, small genomes um, that has been processed for long read sequencing or used long read sequencing for to obtain a comprehensive insight. And nowadays we have really kind of this explosion in the, in, in the late 2020 and then now obviously going into 2021 of studies of human genomes or human genome size um, uh, uh, organisms uh, using either assembly or read mapping approaches. So how does this all relate to the topic of today's um, talk uh, to kind of investigate structural variants in the Hunchinus population? Well, in like early um, or late 2019, um, I was visiting the group uh, from Shuan Fan uh, and the Fudan University, and I was fortunate enough to be invited and give a talk um, about my research. And that, of course, led to an opportunity to sit down with his group and think about uh, what are probably um, collaborations that we can start and, and common interests. And one of the one of the spearheads about that was kind of the obvious point that GRCH38 is not enough. And so what we mean with not enough is like the GRCH38 is clearly just one representation um, kind of scrambled together across different individuals that represent a linear sequence. And for that, it's kind of a great mechanism and it serves as well as a coordinate system. However, um, thinking about different ethnicities, um, either Han Chinese, but also of course Africans or, or others, uh, it's clear that this genome is lacking a lot of information um, that might be either um, not, uh, that they might be either private to Asians or just not uh, represented in this location by a reference. And so uh, it was clear that something had to be done um, because like the Han Chinese is one of our largest ethnicities. It's uh, 1.4 billion people uh, from the ethnicity zone. There is no clear structure around catalog and only a few to non-reference genomes of high quality assemblies are available to represent this population. And so we really kind of settled out to do this um, and, and had this ambitious plan to sequence 1,000 individuals um, with long read sequencing to really study and be able to study evolution and medical um, reasons uh, for uh, using the structure variant map and across the genome. So the way we did this, um, was by look by sampling or taking a cohort set um, that was really central in, in, in the Han Chinese population. And in fact, we actually required that all the samples that we are sequencing have been for three generations or longer in this district of China. And we used the Oxford uh, nanopore Promethean system to sequence these samples. So basically, we run one flow cell per sample. And then uh, on the on the tool side, we use uh, different tools uh, that my group and I developed, uh, which I just want to go through very briefly. So for mapping the, uh, for mapping the reads back to the GRCH38 reference, uh, we used NGMLR. 
Um, here I'm just showing you one screenshot and one of the motivations why we use this tool, despite that, that we developed it, of course, that uh, here we might be a little bit biased. Um, so here in this IGV screenshot, you see the different reads, which is each one line uh, coming from left to the right. And you can see nicely indicated that there's a homozygous uh, deletion indicated by this black line. And in the top, you can actually see as well the drop of coverage uh, in this specific region. So NGMLR is, is kind of a nice uh, method to align this long read and accurately identify the breakpoints as well as the structure down type uh, that is present in certain regions. Then for calling, we use Sniffles. Sniffles is a tool that I developed um, back in my postdoc and going into my faculty position in Baylor. Um, it has a sensitivity of around 88.7% and a precision of 85%, um, given this coverage levels that we are using here in the study. Um, here on the right side, I'm just showing you an overview about different benchmarks based on simulated data. Uh, in short, the more green, the better it is, and the more precise it is. And then you have yellows in the case uh, doing indications of these correct structural line calls. This can be like inaccuracy and breakpoints, um, or interesting the um, duplication base here, where small duplications will be reported as insertions actually. And this is what we compared it to. We compared it to short reads, which is the first row uh, labeled survivor, um, where you can see that we are lacking here lots of insertion calls on the top, on the, on the left side, um, and also some characterization of small events. Uh, but then, however, we used survivor, and the reason why we used survivor is we have to compare structure around the merged different BCF files for each individual. And how Survivor does that is by comparing the breakpoints as well as the um, type of the structure run that has been inserted. And based on the breakpoints and the type, it allows to merge uh, two or more structure runs together across different BCF files and create this population BCF file. So this is kind of the entire main pipeline for the identification of structure runs. So first mapping the reads of NGMLR, calling the uh, structure runs based on these mappings using sniffles, and then creating a uh, from going from an individual VCF to population VCF using survivor. The other thing that was necessary to obtain accurate calls uh, was also a genotyping approach of these structure rounds. So on the right side, I'm showing you here the reason for that. So our samples that we sequenced were on average around 15x coverage, first to 15x coverage, which of course is not a lot, but we are speaking about early days of nanopore, quite frankly and hard, hard to manage samples. So in the green dots here, we present the structural round calls that we could obtain by the previous pipeline, uh, by just raw call, uh, by just the noble calling these structural rounds and giving that coverage values. And we can see clearly kind of an indication by the slope of these points um, that there's a bias, meaning that uh, lower coverage samples tend to have more lower numbers of structural rounds identified. However, what we also implemented in Sniffles is a genotype approach, um, which has been reported also and benchmarked by others to be 82% accurate, uh, while genotyping almost 100% of all the structure rounds that it can do. And using this approach, uh, we can recover these samples here indicated by this brown dot. So you can see with this brown dot, we genotype, and this is means like we go back in the individual BEM files and look for all the structure rounds from the population file. Um, these structure rounds. And by that, really diminishing um, or completely getting rid of this bias that is, um, that is due to the lower coverage in certain samples. Clearly, the downside of this approach is that we might have missed uh, some of the private or very rare alleles in the low coverage data set. Um, so when we, look, when we look into this um, data set, uh, what did we find or that what did we see? Well, in total across the 945 Han Chinese um, population, we identified around 96,000 structure rounds, 97,000 structure rounds. The vast majority of it is deletions and insertions. Um, this is an agreement with previous studies that have been published. Um, and then only a very few duplications, translocations, and inversions. Uh, on the right top side, I show you uh, the count of structure rounds versus the length distribution across different types. And like as, as indicated, you can see the different uh, important uh, peaks that we like to see, also based on other studies, 
which is like a large alu peak for insertion deletions labeled here in green and orange. And then the SDA peak and the line peak at around 6 kb, right? Um, we can also see a, a handful of small duplications emerging um, in this kind of smaller, um, smaller size of structure. What was interesting for us, and that led to a couple of speculations, was actually that the insertion versus deletion rate uh, is just about one, uh, which previous studies have been reported a little bit larger, um, but it's just about one for the population level. And then when we look at individual level, it's, it's kind of getting true again that the numbers of insertions are much higher than the numbers of deletions. And this is kind of an interesting observation, uh, at least from my point of view, because like this hints also to the spot on the right side that we see that insertions are, seem to be more frequent in the population or more often shared in the population than the deletions alone. And previous studies have been sequencing a very diverse um, sample, quite frankly. Um, for example, as an ICLAS group has published now two or three papers, and the last one just recently in science, um, which I encourage everyone to, to check out. Uh, but basically there they focus on a large diversity set of different ethnicities and report similar levels of the insertions are much higher than deletions. However, in our data set, we focus on just one ethnicity, obviously, and there we saw this kind of insertion deletion ratio of, of around one on the population level. Um, next, um, we looked, of course, where do these structure variants fall along the genome uh, across this population. Um, as expected, the most of them are falling in intergenic regions, around 85% of them to be precise, or in tronic or non-coding RNA regions. Um, and then only very few are actually intersecting with exonic regions or are precise in near genes or at UTR regions. We also compare our structure around cause sets um, with previous studies. Um, here we found um, actually an overlap, a small overlap on the short read studies of uh, 1KB, uh, 1000 genomes project, and Knomad SV. Um, and then actually interesting, a similar high overlap is found with the Adano et al. study that has occurred, um, I think, 2020 in, in cells from Evan Eichel's lab. And then like the largest overlap, maybe not surprising, we, found, we identified the CB bar, um, which obviously holds structure and counts across many, many different samples. But still in our study, around 51, 52% of all the structure runs can be considered novel and haven't been observed before. Uh, compared all to all these different data resources that we screened for. And this highlights, of course, um, the power of these long read approaches to identify not just also insertions, uh, but also identify structure around in this challenging repeat regions that are often masked out by other uh, studies. To gain further confidence in our structure around calls that we actually did this nice um, exercise here where we use a C typer. So a C typer is a genotype of a structure round, again, going back into the bump files and into the read alignment and identifying if any reads are supporting the certain structure round for short reads. And we used this as read typer uh, together with 100 uh, Illumina Hanshani samples from the human genome sequence, uh, from the human genome uh, structure round um, variation group. And produced this kind of bar chart here on the right. What has been taken account is again, like you doing this approach to so comparing long read as we call with short read data is not very trivial, quite frankly. Um, and we have been previously publishing, here's the paper on the bottom left, previously publishing a uh, paper kind of assessing the rate of success of, of doing this. So on the right side, I'll show you here the genotype rate, meaning like what can, what a C type was able to genotype versus their leaf frequency in our own core set, right? And what you can see from the results, the genotype deletions, duplications, and inversions, because the retyper wasn't possible, wasn't able to genotype inversions. Um, what we can see here is very interesting. So when we have structure variants, for example, deletions here on 0 to 0 0.1% of the leaf frequency in long read, um, of course, they are not very often genotyped in the 100 data sets of Illumina, right? But when we increase the frequency of these structure runs in our long reads on x-axis, we see clearly an increase of the genotype rate indicated in the y-axis across the short reads. 
And this kind of increase makes a lot of sense to us because like with the higher allele frequency of a, of a of an SV, the higher is the probability that this SV is actually carried also in another hunch in these data. So overall, this was kind of an interesting side study, a side um, plot that A, boosted our confidence into our structure band catalog because like uh, it behaved as expected that the two allele frequencies are, uh, that the allele frequency is correlated with the genotype rate. Um, and, and that was also an interesting insight. So now we have kind of established the structure and catalog. It's still like a VCF file. This is kind of interesting, but and fine. But like now, let's let's stick into this kind of um, biology and genomics and what we can actually learn about using this uh, VCF file. So the first thing we looked at was where do these structure and cluster across the genome? And of course, we compared this also to other studies to see what is novel to our assessment versus to other studies. So in total, we identified 504 structural and hotspots um, using a window size of 100 kb. And when we do this, of course, we also wanted to see if there's any co enrichment um, for certain uh, terms. Uh, the first thing we observed, obviously, on the on the right side, is like a lot of SV hotspots that we identified are on the telomeric um, or telomeres on different chromosomes. But there has been also a lot of non centromeric or non telomeric uh, structure band um, hotspots. And one of which is obviously here in chromosome 6, which highlights obviously the HLA locus, which we know should be there because like, this is a highly diverse uh, locus, uh, important in immune response uh, for humans. And therefore, undergoes a lot of structure band. Um, so this is, should be present in every study. Um, when we do the go enrichment across these 504 hotspots of SV, we see cell to cell signaling, uh, clicken processing, keratin filament, and immune degraded responses, for example, this HLA locus on chromosome 6. Uh, next, we kind of dig deeper a little bit and see how this overlaps to previous studies. So, again, like the 405 SV hotspots, actually, interestingly, 227 of them overlap with the Dano et al. paper. Um, from 2020 or 2019 from Adam Eichler's And I'm saying that interestingly, because like here they use only a few genomes, including like one or two, um, I think, Hanshanese genomes, and assembled the, the, these genomes to detect these structural variants. And interestingly, because when we compare it to the 1000 um, genome data set or the GNOMA three data set, which in numbers of genomes have a much higher number. Uh, of individuals represented. However, using short reads or, for example, in the Thousand Genomes project using low coverage, then we see that overlap is actually diminished, actually, again, pointing to the fact that long reads make a huge difference here. And you can see this nicely on the Venn diagram on the right side, uh, where we compared the different intersecting overlaps. And again, like if you look at the GNOME SV versus the Thousand Genomes data set, these are kind of quite uh, in disagreement with each other. Whereas the two long read based studies, um, Adano's paper, as well as ours, which of course has much more, many, has many more samples, are actually in much higher agreement with each other here, around 160, um, directly overlapping and just private between the two long -read studies. So the other thing we looked at were, of course, SV deserts. And with SV deserts, um, we mean here. Um, Regions of the genome that have been less, uh, that observed less mutations than expected, so like highly conserved uh, regions. For that purpose, we also looked at the kind of highly conserved score, uh, the FAST score um, across the genome. And we can see that these kind of regions uh, where we didn't identify structure them have indeed also significantly higher um, FAST uh, CON score, uh, indicating the conservation uh, and not. Uh, highly mutated regions in these regions. So next, again, like we were interested in the biology behind this, right? So like, what can we learn from these SV health spots um, and what can be relevant for this Han Chinese population? So this one interesting thing that we could find uh, with this hotspots was uh, the Amy locus. Um, the Amy locus is a well-known locus for human adoption in high starch diets which means uh, obviously rice and wheat diets, uh, which are two high starch grains uh, that is heavily consumed uh, in the Han Chinese population. 
And here we identified multiple duplications highlighting this loci as a as the hotspot, which is actually private to our study and hasn't been identified in other studies so far. Um, one of the reasons why we think this is the case, because like for example, Africans will also have this kind of loci um, likely uh, amplified and mutated, um, since they also often have a high starch diet, is because in this particular case, this loci is, is highly repetitive. And so short read studies can again not map into this locus easily and identify this variant easily. However, with, us, uh, with our study, despite they having uh, lower coverage, um, we can clearly identify the structure lines across the loci. Um, and the next thing, what we looked at was, of course, natural knockout genes. So these are important mutations since they kind of completely knock out certain genes um, across the genome. In total, in our call set, we had 15,800 homozygous deletions. 300 of them um, overlap protein coding genes. And 217 of those were not previously reported, despite having a, having an allele median allele frequency of 0, 0, 0, 0.009. So a lot of them are obviously very private. And that's what you what we would expect, quite frankly, across such a data set. Nevertheless, Ten or we identified 10 macro natural knockout genes with an allele frequency of above 10% in our data set. And they often responded to immune uh, response, gene expression regulation, olifactory, uh, and oocyte uh, meiosis, which was kind of interesting to see. And then on the top right here, I'm just showing you this plot um, indicating the differences in the allele frequency between the genetic, uh, genomic uh, regions and this natural knockout gene. And then highly relevant and interesting, again, and this is why I'm highlighting them here, are the three natural knockout genes that we found with an allele frequency of actually 90% or higher in our catalog of structures around across this uh, almost 1,000 genes. And this includes the gene CICLEC-14, CNF-98, uh, and CNF-492. Uh, um, which are highly uh, marked out in our catalog. Um, next, we want to see, of course, if we can use this structure band catalog to identify which structure bands are impacting certain traits or certain phenotypes, phenotypes um, across the population. So for that, we actually um, use the EBI was catalog to overlap these structure bands and to identify overlap or close proximity of our structure bands with the reported GWAS um, SNPs um, and investigated like that. So 288 structure bands directly overlap with this GWAS catalog uh, SMB that has been previously reported. And 1,099 structure bands were in close proximity, meaning less than one kp apart uh, from lots of these um, GWAS effects a lot of these GWAS uh, informative SNPs that have been characterized in previous studies. And obviously we looked into this um, here on the left side, we're giving you um, the, the measurement of impact across different phenotypes. And lots of these have to do with diseases or disease risks or simply other phenotypes. One of the examples that I want to highlight here is interesting. So like this is a small deletion um, across uh, ACAM. So ACAN is, uh, is a 172 base per deletion, actually, of exon 12 uh, in ACAN. And ACAN is a known gene that impacts the human height. The mutations of that gene have been highlighted to have exactly this kind of um, impact. Um, as you can see here, there are two SNPs associated with height and body fat, exactly at this local losses. Um, and the deletion that we identified are actually uh, quite common in the population. So it's 28% uh, uh, of the frequency in our VCF file. Um, when we zoom out a little bit from exactly the spot where this deletion is sitting uh, to the entire gene and looking at what kind of other GWAS hits we obtain in this gene, it's like it's getting clearer and clearer the importance of ACAN in terms of human uh, hate and human body mass. You see here a lot of different SNPs um, indicating this um, from the from the GWAS catalog. So when we use um, our deletion that we identified again, like around 28% allele frequency, 
to stratify the height of our cohort, we can see actually a nice little correlation. So what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the height of the individuals that we had in our study. And then like in red is when the individuals don't carry that, that deletion. In green is when the individuals carry the heterozygous uh, genotype of this deletion. And in blue, it, they carry a homozygous um, deletion at this location. And you can see a little bit of a diminishing um, body height. Of course, this is not kind of as clear as night and day maybe, because like everyone that has been studying human hate will, will uh, agree that human hate is a very complex trait and is of course not just impacted by genetic factors, but also uh, impacted by diet and other environmental factors. So this was kind of curious to see that uh, the deletion that hit near um, reported she was um, hit from SMBs actually recapitulate um, this like uh, nice height difference across individuals. Another example when it comes to human height, but a little bit more complex uh, to interpret, was this uh, interesting deletion um, in the AATK uh, gene. Uh, this is a 50 base, 51 base per deletion. And AATK is actually enhanced to regulate uh, BA1, BAIAT2, I always try to use that name. And I'm showing you here uh, the kind of interaction map in the middle of this plot. BAD2 has actually been associated to multiple phenotypes, um, which I'll show you here, um, which includes uh, behavior, neurological, cardiovascular system, uh, embryonic, um, but also growth and size of the body <coughs> itself. So given this um, different impacts and different phenotypes, we again use the uh, height measurement of our um, cohort um, to assess the impact of the deletion that we identified in this enhanced gene, um, this regulated gene. And you can see here that again, like a little bit of a difference in the individual um, median sizes and the individual median measurements of the, of the body height um, in the y-axis during the different genotype um, of this deletion that we had. It's not as strong, quite frankly, but like it's very interesting and curious to see. The very last uh, example that I want to highlight today uh, in terms of uh, with this regard is actually a 91 based uh, deletion. Uh, 91 base per deletion in CD, CD9. Um, it has an allele frequency of, of almost 40% in our data set um, and had multiple implications um, for this gene as well. So, this was kind of an excurs about um, how these structure variants impact uh, several important traits and potentially important genes uh, across GSEH38. However, as, as we started this journey, the question was initially, uh, what are we actually missing in GRCH38 and how a human reference genome may should be extended, right? So to loop back to this kind of question, um, we assembled the unmapped pre uh, using fly um, and then uh, took these contexts that we obtained from the assembly and filtered them against NCBI to rule out certain contaminations, to rule out um, um, other species in the process uh, that have been maybe in the, assembled in the process of taking all the unmapped reads from these samples. So once we filtered this context set, we, we could uh, use plots with a high identity and length threshold and could identify 851 of these contexts that we could still map back to GSCH38. Um, these are likely representing regions where little gaps are in the current reference genome um, or maybe going into uh, uh, telomeric or, or, or centromeric regions. But with that regard, what was interesting is we could align 1,478 of the remaining contexts to the T2T reference. And I think this really speaks to the quality of the T2T reference as a, as a potential new reference genome. Because here we could anchor um, these contexts into uh, to centromeres and telomeric regions. 
and confirm that these contexts are likely from this location. Still, there were lots of different contexts uh, remaining um, from our assembly uh, that hasn't been as those uh, assigned to 38 or to TPT. So the next thing uh, what we did was aligning to different hominid species. So this includes, for example, chimps, um, with the motivation to identify contexts that are actually historically in the human genome, but maybe not just not represented in the human genome as its, as its current version, right? Because like it just represents a mixture of different uh, humans in a linear record, in a linear base. So 689 of these contexts could have been aligned to the hominids using plot. Um, and then from the remaining, we still had 560 that we could still get in anchored We're using our reads, uh, longer short reads, into GRC38, uh, representing clearly completely novel regions of the, of the uh, compared to the reference genome. You know. um, we next took the assemblies that are just got published on the science paper from Evan Eichel's group and used them as a, as a target. And there we could again align a lot a high number of these contexts, so for almost 3,000 of these contexts, the remaining contexts um, could have been aligned to this uh, reference. Um, in, because this was interesting because um, these uh, HGSV assemblies represent different diversity groups, including also Han Chinese assembly. Um, and then the last measure, we aligned back the multiple short read data sets to this assembly and could still identify support of 745 of these contexts, but we don't really know where to place them right now in the human genome with respect to 38. And then 446 of the contexts that we assembled in total um, are still remaining unidentified. So we are currently not clear where they are or where they should belong to. We didn't find huge support um, of where they should be placed in the human reference genome and maybe uh, require certain uh, uh, in the additional studies. So first, um, this is a lot to take in, but like as we go from top to bottom, um, we shaped off the 851 context to 38 and the 1,400 to the T2T and Humini and so on and so forth. So only 446 contexts remain unanswered where they should belong to. When we look at where do these contexts fall, as I already uh, alluded a little bit, most of them are falling into telomeric regions. So here's the list over from our mapping to where it would land in the T2T um, genome uh, with respect to chromosome arms. And on the right side is, is those uh, contexts that we could anchor uh, using short reads. So most of them are falling in, in close to centromeres or close to telomeres. However, there are still several um, cases where they actually fall in the middle of, of, the, of the chromosomes, indicating novel regions that are highly likely to carry these certain genes and are important. The other thing that I found very interesting, that's why I want to spend a few minutes here, is uh, the hominid case. So like here, we could align, as I said, like 689 into chimpanzees, uh, and then like smaller and smaller fractions of these contexts, also the gorillas or in and and in general, like different monkeys like these different attacks. And this follows, of course, the evolutionary distance in terms of genome evolution um, from human to different uh, hominids and monkeys, um, indicated by the leaf tree here. Um, so what we see, like for example here, we see uh, on the top, on the bottom left, a screenshot from UCSD uh, genome browser. Um, in brown, you have the assembly of chimp. The black bar here is then the context that we assembled from our unmapped read that beautifully aligned. Uh, to the chimp reference, you can see hopefully a few differences between our context and the chimp, because like obviously we are assembling the human context and not chimp context, right? However, what's really the fascinating part is that this context, uh, when uh, actually the fascinating part is when we look at the liftover files from the chimp to the human genome, and the human genome here is in pink, we see there's a huge gap uh, in the human genome for this region which exactly represents the location uh, where our context from our Han Chinese data set fits in, right? So this kind of confirms, so to speak, um, the absence of this sequence in the human genome, 38 or 37 or, or others, therefore, 
Um, but due to the alignment and the lift over to the chimp confronts with this region, actually could be a, a human uh, reference, a uh, human gene or human um, genomic location that should be represented in 38. Um, we could be investigating currently this context closer. We don't think that they are unique or, or specific to the Han Chinese ethnicity. We got more from short reads derived from other ethnicities from the HTSV group, uh, obtained from the HTSV group, uh, which confirmed that these contexts that we identified are actually better representation of the, of the diversity of the human genomes across multiple ethnicities. So with that, actually, I want to kind of summarize the, the talk today. Uh, so what did we find and what did we learn? Um, well, we identified a lot of novel structure variants uh, in, in our current study of the 1,000 Han Chinese um, individuals using Oxford nanopores uh, for sequencing. Um, we could identify that what was interesting for me, at least personally, that we observed a similar ratio of insertion deletions on the individual level compared to previous studies. However, when we see it on the population level, these insertions seem to have a higher yield frequency um, compared to the individual level, and therefore the ratio of insertions and deletions is, is, is moved. Um, we could see that structure bands and the hotspots have multiple phenotypic implications or impacts. Uh, I showed you the AMO locus, uh, which was previously reported for starch diets. Uh, where we observed multiple duplications in our data set that were actually private to our data set just because this low size is highly repetitive um, and therefore inaccessible for multiple other short read studies. Um, and that then I also showed you a couple of stories uh, where, where structure variants directly impact um, certain genes responsible for height. And then lastly, um, very interestingly, I think, uh, we showed you certain biases in the GSEH 38 towards ethnicities. Maybe that's not surprising enough, but we could really assemble using this data set. We could assemble contexts and therefore genomic locations that we can confidently assign to the human genome that are either represented, for example, partially by the T2T consortium, however, also by other genomes uh, representing high diversity of the human genomes uh, and, and ethnicities. And some of them can actually also play place in the homini um, clade or, or different apes or different monkeys, uh, indicating that we're actually, despite having a long history of having a high quality reference genome for humans, um, we still lack a lot of uh, representation of different ethnicities in respect to this reference. Uh, in terms of tools, what did we use? We used NextGenMapLR, which is a long read mapper um, and has a very precise way of aligning this long read uh, because it uses a convex gap cost model and a new way of splitting these reads. Uh, it's really available here on this GitHub. Uh, and we use this together with sniffles. The sniffles is the, the structure bound call of a long read. Um, <coughs> it can identify um, all different types of structure bounds, including all the nested or complex structure bounds. And it also allows us to genotype the structure variants across the population. And together with um, Survivor, which is kind of a toolkit for merging, comparing, uh, filtering structure variants, it allowed us to produce kind of a squared off VCF for four structure variants. And with squared off, I mean that we have reliable genotype calls across every structure variant, across every individual. And if you're interested in, in these free tools, uh, there are two publications out of my group, uh, being in Nature Methods and Nature Communications, uh, where we detail these uh, tools and, and how they work and which uh, heuristics they use. So this brings me to the acknowledgments. Um, so I, of course, want to thank uh, Labroot uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the work here and today. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed the talk. I really have to acknowledge my team and my colleagues at the Human Genome Sequencing Center of Baylor College of Medicine and general funding from NIH. Um, on the, on the, and this work wouldn't have been possible, quite frankly, um, with the awesome collaboration uh, with Sean's uh, group from Fudan University. So here is just one, uh, one photo of us having a barbecue um, in Shanghai, uh, which was very interesting. 
Um, and like, yes, so lastly, uh, my group is always on the lookout for, for new talent, new postdocs or PhD students. So please just feel free to reach out or DM me um, over, to, over Twitter. Um, and with that, I thank everyone uh, for their attention. I'm happy to take any questions.